Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you to my dear friend and mentor, although he, I think he probably hates for me to say it, Ira Katznelson, um, for that incredibly warm and generous introduction and words that um, really mean the world to me coming from Ira, uh, the 2015 Harold Laswell Fellow of the Academy. I wish to convey my appreciation to the Academy's distinguished board of directors and to its president, Ken, Hewitt, Ken Pruitt, for this tremendous honor. It's a distinct pleasure and a point of pride to be recognized as the 2019 Ernest Burgess Fellow, a Burgess Fellow of the American Academy of Political and Social Science, and to receive this recognition alongside a group of truly extraordinary colleagues. Rarely a day passes um, that I don't think at some point and marvel at some point quite literally about the fact that my life's work is the pursuit of knowledge and better understanding of the world for myself and others. And in this journey, I certainly have been aided immeasurably by the bold harmonizing of scholarly voice and public voice, to which Kimberly Crenshaw, Raj Chetty, Nicholas Lehman, and Paul Krugman are committed to vocalizing toward the end of improving the common good, as the Academy's mission statement puts it. For my part, throughout my career, I've been interested in one set of intersecting questions about our shared humanity and about its implications for social life. What does it mean to emerge from a legacy in which your community has been the very literal objects, and in some cases, the originary objects of scientific examination, of technological scrutiny, of medical experimentation? What does it mean for the universality of human value when some groups are always conceived of as either being in excess or in deficit to some unmarked medical or technical norm? Even as that norm was and is constituted by the classification, measurement, and dispossession of those deemed to fall outside of the canopy of humanity. A quiet but prescient sociological monograph was published by Troy Duster, one of my most important teachers in 1990, nearly three decades ago. And backdoor to eugenics, Duster documented a social world rarely explored by social scientists, that of human genetic science and its implications. In this wide-ranging book that travels from Greece to Sweden and across the United States, Duster made a provocative argument about how intertwined and seemingly interdependent social forces were giving rise to new, broad, and potentially dangerous uses of genetic analyses. This was an incredibly forward-looking book and forward-looking scholarship, some three decades hence or past, when our national concerns were keyed to the reunification of Germany or the release of Nelson Mandela from Victor Verster prison in South Africa, and the Human Genome Project was only beginning to be. Backdoor to eugenics. Gen genetics boldly across the threshold and through the front door was for Truster, Duster, the strident genetic determinism of Nazi Germany that mobilized science and technology with propaganda and statecraft, demonization and tyranny against those with so-called undesirable traits. Think here of the Nazi genocide and sterilization programs Think here also of the exclusionary immigration policies of the United States in the 1920s. The rise of genetic tests and their uses and abuses opens a backdoor, Duster argued, to genetics or to eugenics. He noted the increasing contemporary popularity of genetic term, uh, determinism and social science literature and scientific literature, and also in the social, political, and technological sources um, of this trend. So this was a kind of wide-ranging sort of map that Duster created for us, that the part of the prescience of the book is that he linked together things that we didn't think go together. The appeal of genetic determinism, the use of the scientific method to fit ideologies that justified inequality and racism, the sociology of race and the classification of inherited medical disorders, the role of government and private business as funders of genetic screening programs, even in the 1980s, and genetic determinism and genes as explanation of crime, of intelligence, and other social behaviors. So this book was deeply ecological, but not in ways that Ernest Burgess, um, who brings us a wonderful ecological model from the Chicago School, might have recognized. This was not a formation of concentric circles or scalar relationships of the city, um, but this was a network, a rhizome, a way of thinking about the ways that genetic testing, genetic analysis, human genetic science might be impacting our world as a kind of web of connections in the years to come. 
After Duster, my recent work has come to trace the evolution of what genetic analysis has come to be and do in the world. The social life of DNA for me is about how the geneticization of modern societies happens not simply because of one test in one domain of life, one laboratory, one criminal science lab, but rather threatens to consume all of life, every explanation, every justification, every classification, every inclusion, every exclusion, genetic. The logics and techniques of DNA analysis from a kind of prism of heritability, um, to use Juster's words, to molecular scale, to statistical methods, to probabilistic algorithms, to biobanks, and so forth, allow the production of information, of new data flows beyond the concentric circles of life to the wider world. Genetic data is multivocal and contains information that can be used in various facets of society, regardless of its original source or the original intent of its user. And genes are omnibus. They confer many types of information simultaneously. DNA analysis, therefore, moves across and beyond the expected social domains and also beyond them into a wider set of arenas with expanded purpose. Political claims made via genetics are always simultaneously about the individual and the collectivity, about the micro and the macro. More than one reviewer of Duster's Backdoor to Eugenics book noted um, and point, uh, noted that um, it was about what might be rather than what was. And there were, the book was not, I must say, as, as like, positively reviewed as one would have thought it should have been. Um, so, but I think this is a good thing. It's a gesture in what we've come to call anticipatory social research and a project we're developing at the Social Science Research Council. For Duster pointed to the potential outcome of the convergence of social, political, and technological transformations um, of a coming eugenic social world. He showed how sickle cell anemia had already led to compounded and new discrimination uh, among its disproportionately black American carriers, and noted too that this distant future awaited others um, with inherited disorders. The front door to eugenics, Duster would write, is closed. Yet today we might say, with last summer's news of businesses volunteering their direct to consumer genetic ancestry tests, to reunite families separated at the US-Mexico border as an act of mercy and a gesture of charity, or with yesterday's news of proposed federal DNA testing of asylum seekers whose DNA data would go into the FBI's combined, uh, data, uh, combined DNA index system or CODIS system filed without permission as criminal suspects. And ways harking back and indeed superseding the genetic uses for immigration in the early 20th century. We must say today that the front door may be reopening. Burgess was widely known for his work on prediction. Perhaps more important today for social scientists is the work of anticipation, a willingness to take the best of what we know and put that to gesture toward a tentative research agenda that allows us to capture and understand emergent social phenomena, much as Duster did. I am greatly honored that the Academy has bestowed this recognition on me and on a desire to have a tentative research agenda that gestures to the what might be. I'm grateful for the opportunity to aspire to work that has impact and endures and to now do this as a member of this distinguished community of Academy Fellows. Last, but always first in my life and heart, I want to thank and all give hail to my non-academic husband, Garo, who, <laughs> with the patience of an ethnographer, looks upon our academic world with bemused wonder as he does the urgent on the ground work every day of improving the common good by helping to ensure affordable housing in New York City. But he loves me and therefore, therefore the slow life of the mind none, nonetheless and indeed what could be better than that. Thank you.